So we can all use a little break after that last episode, right? And and uh, knowing what's coming after this episode, when things get sort of pretty heavy, I think it'd be good for us all to just sort of like, just cool it for a little while, have a nice, easy, palatable episode. All right, we're just going to talk about some music that I wanted to talk about this summer. And then in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes, we're going to switch over and we're going to roll back to September and we're going to listen in on excerpts from this conversation that I had with Travis the Millennial. So had I not been so distracted by all these different things that were going on, I definitely would have been telling you about this kid named Gus Dapperton. Now, Gus Dapperton is a kid that I've been watching for like two years. I'm very, very, very intrigued by Gus Dapperton. I'm very interested in what is going to happen with him. I want you to see it and hear it for yourself and you can make your own opinion. Okay, but what I will say is that there is something very unique about this kid and there's also something very genuine about him. And so I'm going to steer you first toward watching a video for this song called Prune, You Talk Funny. I mean, I don't know. What do you want me to do? It's the name of the song. Okay. after that, he just released this new single and this new video for a song called World Class Cinema. So check both of those things out. I'm going to tell you to listen to a couple things now, but the, the thing about him is that he's only put out two EPs so far. So we've only got, we've only got nine songs. So the sample size is very small, but I'm just saying, I think there's a lot of road ahead of this dude. And I think he's going to do some really cool shit. Okay. So if you check out those two videos and you're into them after that, go listen to I'm Just Snacking and then go listen to the last song on his latest EP, which was called You Think You're a Comic. The song is called Beyond Amends and that was one of my favorite songs that came out this past year. In fact, it's just one of my favorite songs in general. I like, I love Gus Dapperton. I like this kid a lot and I'm very, I'm, I'm excited to see what he's gonna do. Go check Gus Dapperton. I, I, I would have told you that if I hadn't been so fucking distracted by all this other shit. Had I not been so distracted, I might have said something to you like, man, I have been listening to that latest Miguel record a lot this summer, that record called War and Leisure. I might have told you how much I really fucking love that record. I might have said something like, you know, for like two records now, Miguel's been really hit or miss. When he hits, it's way out of the park. But when it misses, it just falls kind of flat for me. And I've been waiting for him to just have a whole record where like everything is put together. And this record, War and Leisure, is that record. I love it there's too many songs on it that i'd love for me to list off um i just think it's fucking great i know that it came out in december of last year but i just kind of started getting back into it again this spring and summer i love it and i might have said something like you should really go listen to that now i don't know if this one will make the cut or not but it's a very important one to me I'd say right around June or July, I found this song from Los Lobos. I know. Oh, you're going to tell me about Los Lobos? They played La Bamba and all, right? There's so much to that band than that. And if you're not fucking ignorant, then you would either already know that or you'd go and you would figure that out for yourself. Los Lobos is a fucking incredible band. They're an institution. Um, and I love them. When we used to tour with Rustic, there was a really, really, really influential record that got brought into the... Uh, rotation in our van that our sound engineer actually brought out on tour and we did the same thing he's like you guys got to hear this new Los Lobos record and we we're like Los Lobos yeah right and he played us this record called Colossal Head and Colossal Head basically changed everything for Rustic Overtones and the shit that we were trying to do that record influenced us incredibly I still love that record and so I found this Los Lobos song that came out recently this summer called Fear upon first listen I found it very pleasing I just liked the way it sounded. The production's great. The arrangement's really cool. And then as I kept listening to it more and more, this song is so deep to me now. Like, it's like, it, it's heartbreaking. I literally, I don't think I've ever listened to it without getting choked up or, or just flat out crying. And um, having a mother with dementia and my relationship with her, which has... Um, hmm, deteriorated quite a bit over the course of this past summer. This song fucks me up. And I don't I'm, I don't think in any way that it was, you know, written from that same perspective, but the words, every single word, and especially the chorus, makes me think about my mom. And, um, and you think about being a kid and your mom, like when you're sick and your mom coming in, feeling your head and, you know, 
checking for a fee like it that part of it fucks me up so much and then sometimes i make the mistake of like flipping it and hearing it from like my mom's perspective and if it's like having to struggle with whether or not inside of her mind somewhere, even though there is so much confusion and I wonder sometimes if she knows it, you know, real deeply in there somewhere, if she knows that she just can't seem to keep her thoughts straight, she can't seem to remember shit and all that, and she sees us reacting and she just can't do anything about it. And I think about that from her perspective sometimes, and that fucks me up a lot too, so... I don't know, man. Maybe I save that for the next episode. Maybe I leave it right here. I'm not sure. But Los Lobos has a tune called Fear, and you really should check that out. Now, that got serious. So where was I? Right. Okay, so we can put down the whole, like, retroactive thing at this point, okay? Because the stuff I'm going to get into now is more recent, all right? A record that came out about two or three weeks ago that I love, and it has entered the running for my favorite record of the year, along with that Michael Ralt record I talked to you about, along with the Father John Misty record, is this dude named Rustin Kelly. I think it's pronounced Rustin. It could be Rustin. R-U-S-T-O-N Kelly. Um, I wouldn't call it a country record necessarily. There's a lot of Americana. It's, it's um, I don't know. I think fans of Jason Isbell and shit like that will like him just fine. Um, not to mention, um, I've seen a lot of pictures of him where he's wearing Slayer shirts, and I think I might have even seen once he might have had a DRI hat on. So I have this feeling, unless he's doing it to be, you know, sort of like ironic, like I know a lot of rappers are doing that now. They're wearing Metallica t-shirts and, you know, like, so, but I, you know, I get the impression this dude might actually like Slayer as much as I do, which, which makes me like him even more. But anyway, he put out this record called Dying Star. And shit, if it's not like, I, I love it. I probably played the first song four or five times in a row before I moved on to the second song. Um, there's other great songs on it. There's this tune called Faceplant that's great. Big Brown Bus is great. It's a lot of good stuff on there, but the first song is called Cover My Tracks. And it might, it might, I'm not sure I want to say this or not, but it might be a perfect song. And to, to try to avoid a tangent here, like I could do a whole episode on perfect songs. Maybe I will one of these times, but a perfect song has certain criteria. Okay. It has to not be very long or actually it can be long, but it, it needs to not, whatever is there, it needs to not waste your fucking time for a second. It gets in, it makes its point. The melody is married to the lyric perfectly. And like I said, it doesn't fuck around with your time. It gets in, it gets out. Perfect song. Okay. Jonesburg, Illinois by Tom Waits perfect song. Uh, what's another one? Junk, Paul McCartney, perfect song. I mean, Paul McCartney was what? He was nothing but a perfect song machine for his whole entire life. And, and here's an unpopular opinion. So I'll jump right in and say it. Okay. You know what else could have been a perfect song, but isn't in my life by the Beatles could have been a perfect song right up until it gets to that fucking clavinet solo in the middle. I don't need that. I don't fucking need that part. It's moving along perfectly and then that jumps in and it all just gets a little too jovial for me, all right? Here's another one exactly like it. This is gonna piss a lot of people off. Right exactly like it, around the same time, around the same genre, okay? You know what else could have been a perfect song? God Only Knows by The Beach Boys. In fact, that could have been like the most perfect song ever, except for that whole little part in the middle. I'm listening. All of a sudden you get to dun, 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 right? Like I'm listening. Everything's moving along. I'm crying. I'm thinking about somebody. And then all of a sudden, next thing I know, I'm in a fucking cartoon, right? You're in this spot. You're in this place. You're thinking about all this beautiful shit. And then next thing you know, you're at the circus. I don't need that shit. That fucks up everything for me. You know what I'm saying? So it, a lot of things can derail a perfect song for me. Don't fuck around. That doesn't need to be there. So anyway, um, I digress. But this Rustin Kelly record is great. And uh, actually, fuck it. Let's stay here for a second. Um, you know what else is a perfect song? No Hard Feelings by the Avid Brothers. Came out a few years ago on this record called True Sadness. Holy crap is that a fucking perfect song like I can't even think about that song let alone listen to it without getting like sort of overwhelmed by it it is it, it is so fucking amazing part of the criteria of a perfect song I know these are sort of somber but I guess that sort of goes with it but like part of the criteria is being 
amazed that this thing was it, it like it was written by an actual mortal human being and not by some sorcerer or fucking wizard that has lived for two billion years and has has found some magic to the art of songwriting like this is an actual mortal human who has written this song and it's almost like unfathomable that somebody came up with these lyrics and this melody and married it all together that song's insane. And by the way, whoever's listening, you're responsible for this. If I should ever just, you know, if I, if, if I ever leave here suddenly, you know, some accident happens or whatever, I pass away suddenly. Um, that is the song that I want playing at my, f you know, that part of the funeral, right? Where, where as they're, as they're kind of rolling you out the door and there's some song playing and, uh, that's the song I want playing right then. And I don't want it to, I don't want to, st don't start pushing me until the song's over, okay? I, none of this, like, halfway through the song, I'm out the door, everybody starts filing out. No, I want the whole thing playing. Don't start rolling me out until the big crescendo at the end. I want to sit there and listen to it with everybody, okay? And for shit's sake, do not let me have a fucking Catholic funeral service. I, I really, I should not have to say that at this point, but, you know, just to make sure, all right? Don't listen to my parents. I don't care what my parents say, what my family says, anybody. Don't allow them to do it. Fight them. Play this for them. Don't let that happen, please. Go listen to No Hard Feelings. And you know what? After that, listen to Rainbow Connection. Rainbow Connection is a perfect song. Forget a human being. That shit was written by a fucking frog. <sighs> Rainbow Connection. Rainbow Connection is um, amazing. I'll fight over that one. I'll fight anybody over that one. Look, like if, if a song can move you to, to feel the kinds of feelings that that song makes you feel shit, if it even can move you to tears and it's being sung by a frog. Do you know how good a song has to be in order for it to move you when it's being played by a puppet of a fucking frog with a fake fucking banjo? That's how good Rainbow Connection is. Rainbow Connection is a perfect song. Now, let me get to one last perfect song before I move on to the last thing that I want to talk about. Okay, I was reminded of a song about a month and a, a month ago or so. I just was reminded of it. I had forgotten about it. I knew it was great already, but I had forgotten about it for a second, okay? There was this girl, back in the 90s, there was this girl named Tracy Bonham, all right? She had a hit song called Mother Mother, and she kind of fell victim to that thing in the 90s where bands would put out these songs, and the label wanted the songs that were really angsty and quirky and all this shit, right? They would catch on quickly, and then they oversaturated, they overdid it, and everybody got fatigued on that artist, and they just went away, and unfortunately, Tracy Bonham got caught in that, and if you're like me, you heard that one Tracy Bonham song, you know, I'm, I'm freezing, I'm hungry, I'm losing my mind, everything's fine, right? That whole one. You heard that and you kind of dismiss Tracy Bonham as this sort of novelty artist. If you're like me, like I said, if you're like me, that's the mistake that you made and you never knew the other shit that she had. And then one day we're riding in the van and again, our sound engineer brings out this Tracy Bonham record and I'm like, oh man, Tracy Bonham, he puts it in, it's fucking incredible. Um, what's it called? I think it's called Burn the Brightest or something like that. Um, anyway, I was reminded of this song by Tracy Bonham and it's called, and the world has the nerve to keep turning and it's fucking incredible. I mean, really, really incredible. Um, and, and I, strangely as, as fate would have it, I was reminded of this song right during the whole Kavanaugh hearings and all of that. And this whole uproar and this whole thing that was going on in the United States now, regardless of where you stood on that, right? Because this is not like a partisan song. This was way before all of this. Regardless of where you stood on that, to me, hearing Tracy Bonham sing that song during that time, like there was something really fucking poignant and powerful about hearing a woman singing the words that she's singing in that song. And as though like the, the title of the song wasn't badass enough, like the whole hook is insane the harmonies the arrangement the production still stands up it's a fucking incredible song i can't recommend enough that you go and listen to that song by tracy bonham and the world has the nerve to keep turning it's fucking awesome now here's the last thing that i need to get to my dude who i have talked about on this show very briefly before but uh my dude gavin castleton who I have toured with, playing drums for him. Also, the two bands that we had when we were starting out and coming up, um, I was, again, in Rustic Overtones. He had this band from Providence called Groovis Malt. We used to play shows together early. That's how we met a long, long time ago. We've remained friends. We've remained peers. I love him very, very much as a person and as an artist. Um, 
And uh, I think that he's one of the most prolific and ambitious artists that I probably will ever know. He's just always doing this really creative shit and he's pushing these boundaries all the time. He can just can't never keeps things simple and predictable. There's always something with his shit that is going to surprise you a little bit. All right. So he puts out a single every Halloween. He drops a single sort of based around Halloween. All right. Now, Gavin's not the kind of guy who's going to go and fucking cover Ghostbusters for you on Halloween. All right. He's not going to do some pedestrian shit. So he comes this year just about a week ago with this song called I Choose You. It's fucking really dark. It's disturbing. It's, um, Substantially, it's depressing, um, but it's also very, very, very beautiful and well-written and well-recorded as all his stuff is. And I'm thinking to myself, this must be some cover from some soundtrack, some thing from back in the 70s or something, some weird play that happened or something like that. And, you know, sounds like it, like Burt Bacharach could have been involved in it or something like that, right? And come to find out, he fucking wrote this song and he wrote it based on, now I see, I don't care about all this stuff, but you might. He wrote all this based on this TV series or web series or something. Um, I'm not sure. I don't watch it. Maybe you do. Called Atlanta. He also detailed on his blog, which is called The Great Consolidation on Blogspot. You can go there if you want to nerd out with Gavin, he spent about 19 paragraphs breaking down in explicit detail what this particular episode meant to him, how he wrote the song based around it, how there's different themes coming in from this and that that are introduced in different ways. Now, I didn't need all that shit because I just liked the way the song felt to me. Um, again, it's beautiful. It's very, very pretty. It's beautiful. The harmonies, the chord progress, it's beautiful. And it's also terrifying and disturbing and sort of disgusting. And, 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 uh, he basically made the sound of everything you've ever watched from David Lynch. He basically turned that into four minutes of sound. Okay. Think of it that way. And it's really incredible. So it was initially only on YouTube. Now I think it's on all digital platforms. You can go and find it again. It's called I Choose You. And it's really fucking remarkable. And you should go check that out. And if you're looking at it on YouTube while you're there, go down the rabbit hole with Gavin. It's fucking fun. And it's huge. And it's endless. You can spend a couple days there if you want. There's a lot of stuff there. But I would suggest going directly over to um, Gavin playing Doom live at Overclock. Check that out for a couple of reasons. One, it's one of my favorite Gavin songs. And two, uh, there's these two drummers who always play with him. Two, two brothers who I've grown to get to know luckily and, and, and really like just two of the most really, really, truly good people that I've ever gotten lucky enough to meet. On top of that, as good as they are as people, they're just as good as drummers. Like they're both insane drummers and it's the Torres brothers, Eduardo and Javier. Each of them have their own YouTube channel, so you can spend some time checking that out too, where they make a bunch of drum videos of their own. Um, Javi and Eddie, uh, Javier Torres, Eduardo Torres, okay? So that particular video of Doom was both of those guys playing the same kit at the same time. They sort of were this two-headed, four-armed monster on that tour, and it's really cool to watch those guys playing this tune together. Um, and then, like I said, keep going down the rabbit hole if you want, but eventually get yourself to Gavin Castleton, Eduardo Plays Bug Guts is what the video is called. And it's just some shit that, you know, was like taken from the audience at the end of one of their sets. And it is just the most epic ending to a fucking concert. Eddie fucking goes off. And it's only two minutes. I'm just telling you, it's, it's just two minutes of total viewing and listening pleasure. It's one of my favorite two minutes that exists on the internet. Um, and it's very much worth just going and checking that out. Everything from the progression they're playing to how the band is just crushing right through it. But watching Eddie go off on it is really fucking remarkable. It's fucking awesome. I can't recommend it enough. Okay. So there's that. All right. Gavin and I, we've been through a lot. We've played a lot of music together. Um, he means the world to me. That said, after hearing I Choose You, I will never, ever 
stay at his house again when I'm visiting with him in Portland, Oregon or passing through Portland, Oregon. Like I'll still go, I'll still go and I'll hang with his family and all of that. And I'll just go to a hotel at the end of the day. That's all. And I'll wake up alive. So that's a good place to put this whole segment down. Um, the, the perfect song tangent did kind of fuck things up. There was other things I wanted to get to. So honorable mention, uh, Kamasi Washington put out a record at the beginning of this summer called Heaven and Earth. That record's fucking incredible. It's insane. It's super ambitious. It's great. You should go find that. Um, I wanted to talk about this guy named Jerry Bird, who I found this summer, who's from back in like the 70s and 80s, but he was a pedal steel player and it's all instrumental pedal steel shit and it's fucking really mellow and it's really beautiful and it's insanely good. So go find find some Jerry Bird, B-Y-R-D. Uh, also, the Big Red Machine record came out, and it's awesome, and you should go look at that. Um, as far as Gavin records go, uh, go listen to Home or Hashtag Blessed. Otherwise, I'm going to put this whole thing down right now because I don't want to waste any more time before I get to Travis. So let's jump back in the time machine, and let's go back to the very beginning of September when we had a little follow-up discussion with Travis the Millennial. Well, yeah. Give or take I don't know who these people are. Bungie? Michael, I'm not. I'm not worried about pain. No, Michael might not be. Not yeah, well, that's that. That's that. That's that. That's that. That's that. That's that. So, phone lines brought to you by ClassyWino.com. I'm going to go finally to my favorite millennial who I look forward to talking to whenever I talk to him. And uh, he's in Massachusetts right now, unfortunately. Uh, has a family member who is nearing or has reached the end of the uh, journey here. And... Uh, but I think he's in good spirits. I talked to him earlier, and we're going to uh, make the call right now. Hello, Tony. Travis. <laughs> Sorry about your uh, grandfather down there. And I know, I know that's why you're in Massachusetts right now. How's everybody holding up? Um, everybody's pretty good. I mean, you know, we have um, my older siblings that came up, which was nice to have a lot of the family here together. And most of them are out for brunch with my grandmother and my parent, or my mom and my aunts are, aunts, yeah, my mom and my aunts are over with um, my grandfather. Uh, speaking of, let's not let's not beat around the bush. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think we know what we need to address. Okay, so um, let's. I think what would be interesting is if we, you know, what I'd like to do first is I'd like to give my version of the story, and then, um, and then and then I'd like to allow you to tell your version of the story because they might. There's a chance, knowing me, and there there's a chance that they might. They might be slightly different. Um, here's here's how what happened. So we arrived on Thursday night. The the tournament, the game start on Friday. We arrived on Thursday. We got there around I don't know seven o'clock. We had this happy hour event for the foundation before. We had a few beers there. So by the time I got to the point, I was already um, inebriated. We lit the fire. We hung out for a few more hours. Right around eleven o'clock or midnight, I had. I'd probably had been overserved, and uh, I just want to go walking around and reflect on everything and just think about how happy I am and and there's this little park in the center of everything like a little common green right Travis mm -hmm. yep and so there I am walking through there in the pitch dark I mean pitch dark at about midnight you guys did this on purpose you knew that I was gonna come up there and I was gonna drink too much on the first night and then I and you know how I like to go off thinking sitting on a rock somewhere and and you waited till I was well let's just be you know Frank like I was drunk I was shit I was hammered and then you waited up you guys waited for me to go walking alone and then it was like a scene out of like an, one of those old gang movies I'm walking through this little center green by myself and I see these shadowy figures in the distance and you said something like, what are you doing out here, old man? I think is what I remember hearing first. <laughs> and I said, oh no, what's going on? And you all approached me, you were with your cousin Henry. I think, I think cousin Georgie might've been with you. There was a whole pack of you kids. You didn't come alone. And then you came down and you surrounded me and you tried to intimidate me. You attempted to engage me in a fight. And yeah. I, I said, Travis, we're not going to do this right now. 
at which point you said something like, oh, you talk all this shit now you're, and now you're just going to walk away like a bitch. And you followed me, all of you guys. You followed me. You flanked me. Here I am just trying to walk by myself, have a nice, you know, little stroll at night. And now I'm surrounded by a bunch of teenagers who are trying to beat me up. It was, it was, you bullied me. I realized that I had no way out of this. So I engaged you. So I'm slapping you around a little bit. I'm on my feet. I'm dancing around. I'm starting to feel pretty good. I'm getting my bearings about me. I'm starting to zone in on your little shadowy figure in the pitch dark that I could barely see. And I'm popping you a couple times with the right. I'm touching you with the left a little bit. And I'm thinking to myself, this is going pretty well. Well, again, I think playing into your plan, I had had too much to drink. That's obvious. I tripped over something. I still I don't, don't think there was anything. I still don't know what that was. <laughs> I'm going to go with one of your friend's foot. <laughs> You put me in some reverse headlock thing, and I felt six of my vertebrae <laughs> pop. Like, I swear you could have heard them out on a boat in the lake. It was so loud. At which point, I panicked, and rightfully so, because what are we doing here? We're up at a fundraiser tournament for the Travis Roy Foundation, and my first thought was, this kid just broke my fucking neck on <laughs> Travis Roy's front lawn. Which, just the thought of that scared the hell out of me, and I tapped out immediately. I tapped out because it, it, it the whole neck thing, it kind of jarred me, and, uh, and also I didn't like where the whole thing was going. So I tapped out. Travis won, everybody. Travis. But here's the thing. In the process of all these wrestling moves, at some point when he took me to the ground, you headbutted me in the face. <laughs> and I had a huge black eye for about six <laughs> days to show for it, which technically was against the rules. You put me in some hold that was completely inappropriate for you to have put me in, by the way. <laughs> then you tried to break my neck, which was very irresponsible, and you headbutted me in the face, which was against the rules, and you should be disqualified, <laughs> stripped of the belt, and it should return to the previous champion. Okay, can I... Does that sound anywhere close to what you remember? So my recollection was, first off, trying to figure out a plan, which was hard, because, first off, you're, you're a little bit heavier than me. You are probably a more experienced fighter than me because, as you know, I'm 16 years old. And you had that one condition where I can't hurt your head. So I was thinking about different takedowns that might work and, like, work for my size compared to your size as well as not hurting your head. I'd like, to make, I'd like to make note that you did try several of those takedowns when I was still on my feet and just mm -hmm. upright, and you failed at, I remember you failing at at least two or three of them. Yep, I kept, I kept trying to work on it. I, I knew I couldn't get stuck underneath you because a couple times you tried to chest wrap me. Yep. Like, make sure that, well, that, that was smart, you know, tire me out, but, but eventually you, um sort of did my job and tripped over yourself very clumsily, <laughs> probably because you were over surfed. And so I thought, this is the perfect opportunity. I'm just going to get this over with because I don't want to hurt him any more than I have to. I don't want this to be embarrassing to him. You know, all my friends are there. And, and so as soon as he's on the ground, I get on top of him. And there's this branch of wrestling sort of where you well it works in all types of uh, martial arts you have legs in on them so that you're like attached to them they can't get rid of you so I do a couple moves make sure he's on his back I didn't want to hurt him you know but he resisted a bunch and finally once he was on his back he started jabbing me in the throat you know <laughs> poking at my eyes <laughs> I couldn't see I couldn't see at all I'm pretty sure he temporarily blinded me from all the poking of the eyes. And so I realized I had to end this soon because he's going to start getting aggressive. So I wrapped my legs around his, and I arched into him to put a little pressure on his back. But 
he did not want to give up there, so I had to grab his head. Okay, no, 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 no. Stop, stop, stop. I'm not going to let you get away from that point. When you said arched into me, there's a very important distinction to that. One of those distinctions is what the name of that um, hold or that maneuver that you were performing on me. The other distinction is that by arched into me, you basically aggressively dry humped me. That's what you really mean by arching into me. That's when I started well, to realize this is not an appropriate situation to be in. And what's the name of that maneuver again? That maneuver is called the Saturday Night Ride. The Saturday you know, Night Ride. It's appropriately named. <laughs> so basically you're chest on chest wrapped around his legs and you arch into him as if it was some sort of activity that you would do on a Saturday night. Uh-huh. But it also restricts my upper body somehow to some degree. There was something you did where I couldn't breathe for a second. And I think yes, that was the part arching of it. into you was putting pressure on your diaphragm, and mm-hmm. I I wanted to end right there. I thought I thought if you well that was when I started. There, that was when I started. Sorry, that was when I started really fighting because I'm like I got to yeah. get out of this fucking hold. This is ridiculous. And yeah, you did. I think at one point you actually shifted me off of you Yeah. while I was trying to do that. But then eventually I got back into it. And, and then that's where you got I, me in that I head. held your arm. I made sure that your arms were not jabbing me in the eye and in the throat. And then you didn't give up, even though I was, you know, arching in pretty hard and making sure that you couldn't breathe. And I just grabbed your neck. Or not, you grabbed your head and shifted it, like like I was holding a football in my arm. Mm. I shifted it a little bit, and then I heard a couple cracks, which is normal for me. Yeah. You know that happened. Not for me. But Tony was very flustered, <laughs> and I felt bad at that moment. I didn't want it to go that far. You know, the whole night I was telling him, like, we don't have to do this. You know, you don't have to go out there and be embarrassed in front of everyone. Like, Travis, you attacked me. You, you just jumped me, me. You. you jumped me with a bunch of your thug cousins. No, I just want to... I mean, cousin, you know, I cousin, wanted... cousin Henry, that kid is like... He's like 6'5". <laughs> and I'm seeing you guys all approaching me in the distance, these shadowy figures. I wanted to make it easier for you. That was my whole goal. Just to get it over as, as quickly as possible without any damage to the head so that we can enjoy the weekend. And in the in the... In the, in the flurry of movement, I guess, somehow, you probably hit yourself in the eye and inflicted <laughs> that black eye. That's what I'm assuming. What, what do you even mean by that? Like, so, somehow in the course of the fight, I, like, hit my eye into my own kneecap or something? <laughs> <laughs> something happened. I know I didn't do it. That's all. I'm, actually, you know, there could have been some exchanges of eye folks. When you started eye poking me, Travis, that wasn't an eye poke. You've seen the pictures. Some of the people listening may have seen the pictures. That is not a black eye that comes from an eye poke. You head butted me at some point when you were <laughs> when you were dry humping me in this Saturday night ride. At some point, I actually think it was when I first started to try to get up from the ground, and when you when you sprung on top of me. I think somewhere in there you head butted me inadvertently. I'm not saying you did it on purpose. I think it was because you were trying to resist you being. Of course, I was trying to ground. resist. We were in a fucking fight, and, That's... and I and I lowered my head so that you couldn't get as much reach with your punch, you know, and that might have that might have been what happened. Well, whatever. I'm gonna motion to the committee and to the chairman, which is your uncle, that there's a reconsideration of the transfer of title. I think that you should. I think this should be reviewed for disqualification. You broke the rules. How about, uh, how are you feeling about Mac Miller? That just happened. Yeah. Um, Any thoughts? He's not really your style. He's not really your style, right? He's a little, in my opinion, I would consider Mac Miller to be a little bit too good to be up your alley. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I said it. Well, okay. Um, well, you know, I listened to his songs. I was never super into him I never like went out and looked for his songs but when I listened to him I could enjoy him how, do you, how, how do you feel about it I think it's too bad I think it's a fucking shame and um, 
you know, I read that it was an overdose. I don't know of what. Um, yeah. I know we've talked about other things and other deaths in music that have happened where I've been a little bit more of a, um, I've had a stronger stance on it. Who was your boy there that you really liked a lot that we talked about the last time? And um, Jesse on three. That's the guy. Pretty tragic. Not tragic. And that was my, that was my whole point with you. You know, you, it's a, uh, what was my saying that I like a lot? Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. And, and, uh, that seemed to have been sort of the life that that guy led, you know, how do you expect that you're, how do you expect that you're going to, um, and the same could be said for, for overdosing on whatever he overdosed on. So I don't want to downplay that. And I guess, Maybe this maybe this conversation serves them both. I don't know, but like, what else do you expect from that kind of lifestyle? If so, you if you live a lifestyle where um, you push the boundaries of drug use and and substance abuse too far regularly, what do you eventually expect is going to happen in your life? And if you, are you and if you push the boundaries of violence whether it be gun violence or domestic violence or just physical violence. Well, how do you, where do you think that's going to lead you someday? Where do you think you're going to end up from that? Both results, I guess what I'm saying, both results are unsurprising to me and don't strike me as tragic so much as, well, I mean, that's what happens. Tragic shit is like, you know, Jeff Buckley, that shit was tragic, right? Do you know Jeff Buckley? No. You'd like Jeff Buckley a lot, Travis. You should check him out. You don't know him because he only got to make one record, and it was an incredible record. It was a classic. It's still a classic to this day. One record. Now, Jeff Buckley, what happened to him? He signed a huge publishing deal. That record was a big hit. Um, he was looking like one of the most promising young artists in in music got a big publishing deal went home to his hometown to celebrate it with his friends they went down to the river they had a fucking bunch of beer and booze and all that and they were just partying and he jumped in the river um i think with his clothes on or something like that like just to be just having this fun moment he jumped in the river and and they ne he never came up again which you know like I think about shit like that. I think that's a tragedy. That was an unforeseen thing that, you know, was just that could have happened in any situation, you know, and it wasn't like he had a <laughs> it wasn't like he had a history of jumping in the river and almost not making it out. And people are like, yo, Jeff, man, listen, you really got to be careful about jumping in the river. You know, like eventually it's not like that. It's just like, you know what I mean? It was a random thing. It was yeah. Like, so I don't know. Do you think if he continued and became bigger, would you say that the public would find out about mistakes in his past? He's probably young. You know, you make mistakes when you're younger. Right? Well, it was a different, it was a very different time. Um, okay. And that's well, I'm also, sure you made mistakes, right? It's also to, when you're younger, it's also, you it's mistakes. also, it's also to assume that he had a bunch of egregious mistakes in his, in his past, which I think to start there is a, is a dangerous place to start. I'm not saying they have to be egregious. They could be minor, minor mistakes. They, you well, know, you don't like know. what? And I don't know. He could have some sort of criminal record. For example. Of some sort. What if he stole something, you know? It's not stole that big something a deal, what? Like a, still like on a, his criminal like a, record. Like a pack of gum? Something. I don't know. He could have gone into a fight. Do you, you think that know. anybody do you think anybody would mind to find out that one day years ago Jeff Buckley stole a six pack of beer or that Jeff Buckley got in a fight outside of a bar? You think anybody would mind that? Um, maybe not back in the day, you know, today, public wouldn't care today. Do you think anybody would probably, I, I wouldn't, would be, I don't think people would getting in a fight with well, some, getting well, in a fight, getting in a, into other people's past recently. Sure. To, sure. To but, but getting qualify anything that they say or do. Well, 
I hope, Travis, that you see the difference between getting in a fight outside of a bar and beating the shit out of a woman. Okay, well, he was found innocent, and there was proof that she lied. Okay, well, that brings us to the next point. Okay, he beat up someone in jail. He was in and out of... He I don't have a problem with have, the dude beating up somebody in jail. I imagine that happens a lot. Yeah, he had a problem. His, his mom had um, schizophrenia and sort of mentally abused him as a child, and he... Um, he got into many fights in schools and ended up moving into several different areas and then finally landing himself in jail. And he got into a fight, obviously, and people had a problem with it because the guy was gay. XXXTentacion beat him up nearly to death, which I would say was not a forgivable mistake. I understand that, but... People make stupid, stupid mistakes when they're younger, especially when they're mentally abused as a child. Mm-hmm. You know? That that seems pretty reasonable to make mistakes. I'm not saying that it was it was a Yeah, but know, we have to you can you understand have to, it, but you have to be careful about about discounting egregious criminal activity solely based on the fact that, you know, in their past they had some um, transgressions done against them. Okay, so for so therefore, you know, it's actually him who's the victim. It's actually him. So all this stuff that he's doing is, you know, we just have to sort of work with it and all that. See, I I don't agree with that. You know, it's it's crimin- what I'm cr- saying is that cr- it is crim- criminality awesome. is criminality, and it has to be. It all needs to be dealt with on a level ground. You know what I mean? Whether whether you were abused or whether you weren't abused, you have to be the same people in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of the system. And it's the same, you know, if you yes. now, now I think still, I did. I, and I didn't, I didn't get to finish my point fully. I'm saying that was a terrible mistake for him to do, but do you know what he was doing or where he was going the day that he died, where he was planning on heading? I think he bought a car or something like that, right? Yep, he was he was looking at cars and bikes and, and such, but do you know where he was heading later that day? I don't. He set up a charity event, and within the last couple months of his life, he was he started trying to turn things around, sending or giving massive donations to domestic abuse uh, foundations and he went and gave a bunch of PS4 consoles to um, impoverished kids Mm. in the South Florida area that he grew up in. And he was just trying to change, you know? Do you believe in second chances? Absolutely. So he was at a turning point in his life where he realized that he made some horrible mistakes and he wanted to turn that around and he wanted to help people and touch people with his music as well as his actions. Hey, look, Trav, I want to be very clear. I'm not I'm not suggesting that the guy should have died. I'm not suggesting that uh I think it's a good thing that he did. I'm not saying any of that. All I'm saying is your 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 behavior in your life affects the results of your life it affects um the consequences and 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 the and the turnout of different things in your life all that is based on your behavior and i know yes. he was trying to turn it around and second chance and all that and that's great that would have been a great story for any person it's always great to see somebody do that with their life but all i'm saying is the things that he did prior unfortunately caught up and that's what happens when you live that way you run the risk of it catching up to you just like violence with, is just very... like just like with 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 drug abuse and everything else just like with anything you know so do you think it's not tragic that he was trying to turn his life around and as he's beginning that change he gets murdered 
I, I, I said already that I think it's unfortunate. I'm still not ready to call it a tragedy because it still is the result of the sum of its parts. Okay. But the, uh, so just, you- I'm trying to give you an idea of like what I think is tragic and what I think is just sort of too bad. So do you think that innocence is more important than saying at this point in um, XXX Tentacion's life, he decided that he wanted to change who he was for the better, and then he died? Okay, I think the question you're asking me is, do I think that it's more important to be without fault and just to live this life that um, doesn't break any laws or get in anybody's way, is that more important than it is to be entirely flawed and have a wake-up moment where you decide you want to turn your life around? Yes, and express their vulnerability and take you know, um, responsibility for their actions. I don't think... I don't think either one are more important than the other. I don't I don't think that, uh, you know, somebody reaching a crossroads in their life and deciding that they want to change and do better um, is always a great thing. But I think at its core, we should just try to be good. You should try to do right by yourself and you should try to do right by the people around you and your community and everything mm-hmm. else. And... Uh, if you decide to do that all along or if you decide to do that halfway through, it's all it's all well and good as long as you're deciding to do it. But all I'm saying is no matter at what point you decide to change and for what reason and to what degree you decide to change, it, it does not indemnify you from your past and what you've already done. That's still going to live there and it's still going to exist and there still might be consequences from it forever. Got it. (laughs) Yeah, well, go charge your phone because you got to drive pretty soon too. So are you going to drive at all today or are you going to be a passenger the whole time? Yeah, I'll probably drive. I drove two hours. I drove two hours up here. Yeah. Yeah. boy. Highway driving? Highway driving. Yeah, dude. Um, Okay, good. Well, then drive safe. Be fucking careful. Okay, well, Tony, thank you very much for having me. It was a great conversation, and I hope to hear from you soon. You will, Travis. Drive safely. Tell everybody I said hello, and I'll talk with you soon. Okay, thank you, Tony. See you, buddy. Good kid, that Travis the Millennial. Um, What we're going to do with him is we're going to kind of you know, give him a rest for a few episodes at least and try not to wear that thing out. And also because I actually want to tease a new guest that I'm going to introduce on my show who will be a regular. And this is an interesting one. I haven't given him his moniker yet, but his name is Pace. His actual real name is Pace. But this kid Pace, I've known him since he was about five years old. His parents are very good friends of mine, and I can tell you that they raised him incredibly, uh, impeccably, and he's a fucking really, really, really bright, sharp, funny, uh, great kid, and just like his dad, he loves to not argue, but he loves to engage in discussions about different things. He's very opinionated, which I also love about him. Basically, Pace has got a really fucking good brain on him. Um, but for whatever reason, Pace has decided now that he's in his early twenties, he's decided he's had this great upbringing and he's, he's been raised in a very unique way that I'll talk about with him. I don't want to spoil that, but, um, but anyway, he's decided that he's going to be a gangster rapper after all this time. And by gangster rapper, I mean like really, really fucking hard gangster rapper. Okay. And I was a big hip hop head growing up. I know a lot about it. Um, I know its origins and I know, you know, I know where it traces to present day and all of that. And uh, I'm not sure why Pace chose this path or why he feels like he needs to have this persona. But that's one of the things that's one of the things that he and I are going to talk about is, um, you know, why can't you use your brain in this stuff? Why can't people be thoughtful in hip hop anymore? Why can't people be anyway? We'll talk. We'll get into that with him. But anyway, 
you can get a head start on that. He goes by the name of Rox the 96er. R-O-X-X. And he's got a bunch of videos. Like, he's hustling. I give him credit for that. But um, I'm going to refuse to let him just spend his uh, early years of adulthood pointing fucking guns at a camera. And I'm going to make him use his fucking brain a little bit because it's a fucking beautiful one. And not only that, but his dad's a big boxing fan. He's a good friend of mine. And we've watched all these fights together. And Pace knows the boxing game very well. And December is a big month for boxing. Um, We have got the heavies are going first. We've got Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury coming up at the beginning of December. And Vasily Lomachenko fights on December 8th. And the cool thing about that is that it's on ESPN, so anybody can watch it. The following weekend, December 15th, my dude Ryan Garcia, I believe, is going to be on the undercard of the Caneo Alvarez-Rocky Fielding fight. We've got three weeks of, like, huge fight cards coming up in December, so I'm going to want to get Pace, or sorry, Rocks. Uh, I'm going to want to get him on my show before December. So sometime in the next few weeks, you can look forward to that. And I guarantee you, like I said, go watch his videos. You might like them. We are going to get into that a little bit. We're going to talk about the two schools, right? You've got, you've got me and his father and all of us, many of us listening that grew up on De La Soul and Tribe. And we got into our hard shit too, you know? Don't forget that our generation was fucking Wu-Tang and Biggie and all this shit, right? And, you know, we had Mob Deep. We had a lot, like, there was all kinds of, like, hard shit that we got into. But, like, there was also a very cultural, like, a movement. And that, I think, is absent from hip-hop right now or from rap right now. So we'll explore that, all right? And so I wanted to get all that in before I transition over to Episode 9. We're going to roll over to this. And I'm just telling you right now, um, everything got really fucked up in my life starting uh, right around Labor Day. Uh, of last September and uh, I went through a lot of hard shit to get back here to where I'm sitting right now I'm not gonna sit here and talk like I'm a fucking war veteran or something like that but you know life can be a fucking battle sometime in itself and um, I'm gonna get into all of that coming up next and that's gonna be out here in just a few days so uh, I guess that's about where it ends now After this, we're going to go, we're going to get all this, where have I been, what happened, shit out of the way, and then we're going to, then we're going to roll on, okay? Again, I'm very grateful to have all you guys back, and and, um, I'm glad to be doing this again. I'm going to let it go right there. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Episode 9 is going to be here in just a few days, and uh, I'll talk with you all soon. All right. Good night.